arrangements and everybody's finding their way to their spots. Can you please turn off your phones and put them in a pocket or somewhere so that we can't actually see them from here on until the end, until you guys go to your lunch? And we're all good to go after that. So I don't know if there'll be a few more people straggling in. If they do, we'll kind of just place them where we need to place them and we'll go from there. You guys were here yesterday, right? So you know kind of how the process works? We're all good? Okay. I'm hoping you brought some questions with you. I heard that yesterday was a pretty good uh, event, so I'm hoping we can sort of equal it today as we move forward. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce the students very briefly, who will then introduce the, uh, the visitors. So Danya, why don't you come up real quick. Re quick round of applause for Danya, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so first, we will have Ms. Sahar Wahba speaking. So Ms. Sahar Wahba is an American, is an Arab American, is an Arab American social entrepreneur and the founder and creative director of Dunier. The company handcrafts beautiful, personal, and, pr and purposeful doll clothes, doll, cloth dolls made from organic cotton and sustainable cotton fiber stuffing and gifts a doll to orphan children for every doll purchase. Dumier, Dumier's purpose is to bring love and light into the lives of our children and children who have not been spoken for. Sahara believes that the creative process is not, is not only liberating, it's healing. Prior to launching Dumier, Sahar was an award-winning designer and had a decade-long career in branding from New York City to Dubai. Please help me welcome Ms. Sahar. Right, Kareem, why don't you come up and you can introduce your visitor as well. And then we'll, and then we'll give you guys a couple moments to talk. All right, thank you. Mr. Charles Blasky. Um, he's the founder and current CEO of Talka Solutions. Um, he was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri, USA, and he graduated with a bachelor's degree in science and medical engineering. Um, Talka Solutions focuses on providing technologically advanced energy solutions for companies and buildings here in Dubai, as well as around the world. And they aim to reduce 20% of the world's energy consumption using technology, finance, engineering, and applying IoT to different companies. Uh, okay, just like yesterday, the idea for today is to have a little bit of time to listen to each person's story, either from a personal kind of standpoint or with regard to the company and how it came to be. So part of this, of course, is connected to your social entrepreneurship. Uh, unit, but really what we're talking about here is kind of stories and how things mesh and how the world of business kind of um, links together with the world of social reality and trying to do two things in once. So you'll be successful in a business environment, but at the same time do good for those around you, for your society, your environment, so on and so forth. So we'd like to start uh, maybe ladies first. And uh, what I'd like to do is give you essentially 10 minutes or less, if you want, whatever works for you, to kind of introduce yourself and do your thing. All right, welcome. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, um, so my name is Sahar, as you know. Um, and I have a doll company called Tumye. And really, I want to kind of start from the beginning, as I started out as a designer. And I went to art school because I thought, through design, we have the power to shape culture. And I thought that was like the most incredible thing. Um, and I graduated from art school, I moved to New York, and I started working in branding, and I worked on some of the biggest brands in the world, from American Express to Estee Lauder to Johnson & Johnson, you name it. Um, and, it and it was good. I did it for like 10 years between New York and Dubai. Um, but at the end of it, I mean, you start to look back and you're like, I don't know if I really shaped culture so much, you know? I didn't, I don't know if I really used my craft for good. And it was lingering, and then um, I became a mom. Um, and with that blessing came this incredible responsibility, you know, to raise my daughter as a citizen of humanity, for um, or her to uh, respect the environment, to have compassion for others, um, to have the willingness and the heart to give to those who have nothing in return to give back to her. Um, and also to kind of honor my own dreams. You know, when you have a kid, you look them in the eye and you're like, you could be anything and you could do anything. And, um, and then when you're not necessarily 
following yours, you kind of think, oh, okay. <laughs> if I want her to do it, the best chance she has is if I set the example. Um, and so I started kind of searching for what, what was gonna be next. And then when I wanted to gift my daughter her first doll, and I started to look into the market to see what was out there, um, I noticed that really dolls sat in one of two categories. They were either with like blue eyeshadow and mini skirts, and um, not really my bag of chips, or they were on like the total opposite spectrum, which was that they um, looked homely, like they lived on the countryside and had no style. And as a designer, that didn't really work for me either. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna make her one, you know, which was way harder than I thought it was gonna be, but eventually I did. Um, and I saw this amazing opportunity. I was like, there's probably lots of other moms out there like me who wanna give their kids something meaningful, something that's, you know, eco-conscious, that's uh, stylish but with values. Um, and if I could wrap up all those things that I really cared about into this one company, it'd be worth a career change. It'd be a living lesson to my daughter about what I thought was important. Um, and so that's what I did. It was a little crazy. Everyone around me thought I was crazy. <laughs> my family were like, what are you doing? You know, you have this like amazing consulting career. What are you doing? Why are you sewing in the basement? But, um, but I just believed like that I could really do something with this. And I had the vision to do it. And so I started this company out of my basement. <laughs> and um, for every doll that we sell, we gift another one to a child in need, as we said. We work mostly with orphanages um, and refugee camps. We, um, the dolls themselves are made with a lot of environmentally conscious materials, organic, sustainable, things like that. We also have a partnership with um, underprivileged women in a rural community in India who support us in some of our production. Um, and then they take their proceeds and they put it into girls' education um, for, the, for their community itself. So at every level of Dumier, we have tried to find ways to make an impact, to do good through the whole supply chain. Because a lot of times what happens is it's great to give back, but it's not great if it's on the back of somebody else, right? Like you want to be able to lift people up through the process. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. That's how we designed the company. Um, the way that we give back to um, underprivileged kids is usually through a doll making workshop, which for me is super special because we can give dolls that are ready made and we do it sometimes for kids that are younger, like five and under who don't have the dexterity to sew. Um, and they love it and they're happy. But what's way more powerful to me are the doll making workshops that we hold because what ends up happening is you go into these places where these children have nothing They've seen a lot. And, um, and you give them crayons and paper, and um, they start to draw, design this character. We give them some parameters, so they start designing a character. And then we pull out these dolls, these blank dolls, and they have no idea that that's coming. And they're like, oh, the kids get so excited. And we pull out all the sewing materials, fabrics, markers, the whole deal. And we help them bring this character to life. And for kids who don't get told, good job, like, look what you did, you know, that's amazing, tell me about that, like, they don't get that kind of attention. And they don't get an opportunity to necessarily share what they're feeling. I mean, art is creative expression. Even when you're young and you don't even know it, it's very difficult to talk about, you know, seeing people being shocked, or I, for anybody it is. But when you stick a child who doesn't have, like, a safe space, um, it's even harder. So you will find that sometimes the dolls have bullet holes in them and they're bleeding and sometimes they're happy and they're like little princesses. I mean, the, it runs the full gamut. Um, but by giving them an opportunity to express themselves, to share a piece of their story, um, there is healing in that. And, um, and it's, I think it's quite liberating to be able to do that. And it's an honor to have been able to create a company that gives them an avenue for that. And one thing that we're doing that I'm, I'm pretty excited about is um, we actually took this workshop. We used to do it where we'd go in and we'd spend like two hours with the kids and two to three hours to do this exercise. Uh, but then we decided actually to make a better, greater impact, we should break this up um, into a curriculum. So we've written a five week program um, that basically takes the kids through the entire process. They learn basic sewing, stitching in one, they develop this character, and at the end, you know, after five weeks, they have their final product. 
Um, and we are piloting that in a refugee camp on the border of Lebanon and Syria in the coming months, which is super duper um, exciting. And I don't know, maybe from a business perspective, you might want to know, Dumier, we sell online, we have an e-commerce business, we do, um, we have retail partnerships, we sell in 25 plus countries, and, um, and that's basically the gist of it. <laughs> I, I'll look forward to hear your, hearing your questions. I definitely should have went first. That's really hard to follow. Um, wow, yeah, great work. Really incredible, uh, good, amazing story. Mine's not that exciting, uh, so I hope I don't let you down. Um, but first, maybe a round of applause for your classmates, Kareem and Danya, who got up and, and introduced us. It's, it's not easy. Uh, they're super smart. So really smart. He knew everything about me and, uh, that I didn't know. So I learned something about myself today. Um, so I'll try not to talk too long. I'll tell you, tell you a little bit about maybe me and, and our, our story as Taka Solutions. Um, and, and I really look forward to the question because I was here last year. I think you were too as well. And you guys are really smart. You know, I remember whenever I was in school, my parents would say that, and I was like, I'm not smart, shut up, you know, I don't want to talk to you. But you know, you guys are really smart, so like the ideas and thoughts and, and questions you guys have, I'm sure are amazing, and will be better ways to get and learn from me and, and us than me rambling on about buildings and how bad they are. Um, but I guess for, for us, it started as, um, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I've been here a little over 10 years, and when I originally came out here from the US, I came to build and design these big buildings and these hotels and all of this glitzy and glamorous stuff. And after doing that for about two or three years, went and started a technology firm in, in Abu Dhabi with some friends. And we kept seeing all these buildings, the ones that were already here and how bad they were. And, and it was really weird in my head because I'm used to making new buildings that are very good and doing it the right way. So seeing this gap between what buildings are in reality and what they could and should be was, was really strange. And so I was sitting in my, my JBR apartment with my roommate, Chris, uh, another American guy from upstate New York. And I was doing some calculations, like how much energy can we save in these buildings, you know? And click, 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 Excel, like hit enter and like this number came up, it was a big number. It's like, oh my gosh, that's a lot. I must have like calculated it wrong. I don't know what I'm doing. So I recalculated it. Sure enough, like I remember I, I yelled at Chris. I was in my underwear, I was like, Chris, 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 come. You gotta come, like, look at this number. We can save so much money in these buildings. Um, he's like, oh, that's pretty cool. So how do we do it? And I was like, well, all you need to do is we need to find some guy with a building and let, tell him to let us on his roof. And all we have to do is install this piece of equipment and then we're gonna save 100,000 dirhams a year. He's like, okay, well, let's find some guy to let us do that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we don't, he doesn't even need to pay us. Um, he's like, so how much are we gonna, how much does it cost? I was like, about 50,000 dirhams. So he's like, okay, so if we can find one of our stupid friends to give us 50,000 dirhams, we'll go buy this thing, find this building, and then we'll put this on there, and you're telling me every year it'll save 100,000. He's like, yeah, every year 100,000. He's like, okay, so if we only take half the savings, and we do that for three years, we've made three times our money. I was like, yeah, I guess that's how that works. He's like, okay, we need to find stupid friends, we need to find a building that lets us do this. Um, and so he brought in kind of the, the financial and business side, and I brought in the engineering side. So basically, what we realized is all of these buildings in this country, not all, there's an asterisk by that, 99.9% .9 of the buildings in this region, and really around the world, are really bad. They consume a lot of energy, they smell bad, bad lighting, they're too cold, they're too hot, bad air quality. Whatever it is, think about it. Think about your house. When I say buildings, I mean your homes, your schools, offices, residential, whatever it is, even hospitals, scary enough. And so what we did, we collectively said, okay, we have this experience designing building buildings, business, property management, whatever it is. Instead of building another bad building that the world doesn't need or another mall that nobody wants and the world doesn't need, let's go fix all the existing buildings that are here. Because what we realized is if you do that, that you can have a really big impact in the world. And so when we started to dig in a little bit more, we're like, okay, we can save 100,000 in this building, that's cool. Okay, we can do 10 buildings, that's a million. What if we did 1,000 buildings? 
What if we did all of Dubai? What if we did all of the UAE? And what we realize is applying this model where the customer doesn't pay anything, right? Remember, we paid for it. We could save 30% of the UAE's energy. 30% could be slashed. And so when you look at that a little bit further, you realize, well, if you save 30% of the UAE's energy, they never need to build another power plant, ever, ever. Um, and if you do that around the world, humankind would never need to build another power plant, ever, right? And then so if you continue to do that and reduce the energy in the buildings, you start to then turn off power plants, right? So if you're turning off power plants, you're saving a lot of energy and a lot of carbon. So what we, we learned was buildings, these buildings that we live, play, and work in, humans spend 95% of our time indoors, right? You're lucky here, you have a very nice outdoor greenery, fountains, like it's like paradise. I wish I could live here, I live on the roof. I don't know, it's better than my place. Um, so maybe you're out, outside more than, more than me, but if you think about it, you sleep nine, 10 hours a day, you're in school four or five hours a day, there's only a couple hours left and you aren't always outside at that free time, right? So 95% of our time as humans is indoors in bad buildings that are making us sick, that consume too much, and they happen to consume 40% of the world's energy, 40%. So that means 40% of global carbon emissions comes from these buildings that are really bad because of us humans. And if we could cut that in half, we would save 20% of the world's energy and carbon and really be a lot further along in solving climate change than we have been in the last 50 years. So we decided to apply our collective strengths to that, to make an impact in the world and not build any, any more bad buildings. So, that's kind of the quick story. It's not all negative, it's actually very positive. Because there's so much opportunity and it's so easy to do, we have the ability to make an impact and, and save the planet. And that's what we're trying to do, one building at a time. Uh, and we do that by going in and upgrading buildings just like this with the latest technology, equipment, AC, lights, um, and then we start to take the data to the cloud and perform artificial intelligence on it to predict what the building will do um, under certain scenarios. So. In a case like this, we would have run a predictive model using AI to say at 11.05, there's gonna be 136 people of a certain age and size and heat output enter this room with these lights on, with this AC setting, it's gonna consume this and then automatically conserve 30% of the energy. So um, that's a little bit about what we do. The whole paid from savings model, we finance all the projects because we realized if we went to every building owner and said, hey, you need to pay a million dirhams and we can save you this energy. No one would do it. No one wants to do it, no one cares enough. So we took that out of the equation and said, look, we'll pay that one million dirhams for you. All you need to do is give us part of the savings. And if we don't save, you don't pay. You don't have to pay us anything. So do that for a few years, we get our money back and we, we cut your building energy by 30%. So that's the basic model um, and the basic premise. And we're working with, we actually looked at this building like five years ago you consume about 40% more than you should. Um, so we go into buildings and we, we, we identify these things and we tell them how they can save and then we help them save and use the latest IoT and AI to, to do that. So we work with hotels, hospitals, residential. You can see it on the website. Um, I'll stop there. And uh, one thing I noticed, like, there's a lot of guys here. There's like the bad boys. Like, and then it looks like all the girls are over here. You guys don't like each other? Or maybe you guys are in trouble with <laughs> That's it. I'm happy you were both well under the 10 minute mark. Good job, everybody. Okay, so um, the next little section here is basically a, a chance for you guys who hopefully have seen some information, uh, bio information, uh, information about the companies before this specific presentation. Uh, but it's a good chance for you guys to make whatever connections you feel you want to make. Uh, ask questions in really any direction, but ideally specific to the companies and how they function or things like that. Um, and then we'll answer them as best as we can. If you have a specific question for a specific person, please identify that as you're saying the statement or as you're saying the question so it makes it easier for us. I saw there was a hand here somewhere to begin with. Did somebody here have their hand up? No? Okay, over in the back corner there. Danya, can you give him the microphone? Um, how
how do you provide like the money to like create these uh, like energy saving things and like do you make money or like <laughs> Two very good questions. Um, so we have a lot of stupid friends. <laughs> That's where we get the money. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so when we started out, I guess a little bit of background. When we started out, we kind of saw these things. Like, imagine, I think when we came in here, there's no one in the auditorium, but the lights were on and the AC was on, right? So sometimes when we go into buildings, it's it doesn't cost money. It's at night, turn your AC off. You'll save. You know, it's that easy. Um, but then we started to realize to do the bigger impact stuff that we wanted to do, like change all the lights in the building, change your entire AC, put in all these IoT sensors. It took a lot of money. So we were lucky enough to actually, they found us. Somebody saw what we were doing and said, we want to give you a whole bunch of money to do this. Um, and they said, you guys find the projects and we'll invest in all of, in all of the projects for you. Um, and so we have a partner, it's a local, a local family office, Chorus Environment is, is the name of it. We're very fortunate to have them. So we have a full financial infrastructure where they invest and then we can get banks to invest and, and other people to invest to invest in, in, in our project. So, um, and do we make money? Yes, we try to make money. If we save, we can make money. Um, so it's a question actually our customers ask a lot. Um, and it's a very legitimate question because they want to make sure that we're motivated to save. They don't want us to lose money and then not come back and save. So we do make money. We make money on, on performing the work. So in that example of that equipment on the roof, we, if it cost 50,000 dirhams and it saved 100,000 a year, and we took 50% of the savings, so we get 50,000 a year, um, we would do that for three years and make 150,000. So we tripled the money. It's not quite that simple, but yes, we, that's, that's how we do it, obviously. Uh, there's other costs involved, the cost of finance and, and maintenance and stuff. So. Um, what do your dolls look like? Um, well, I could show you on my cell phone. <laughs> we have, uh, the dolls are made with cloth. And you can actually personalize them. So when you go on our website, there's a little doll building tool. You can choose the doll's skin tone, hair color, hairstyle, eye color. Um, their clothes are quite stylish. So um, yeah, I don't know, from everything from <laughs> tutus to, I don't know, but they're quite stylish. And we have, those are our premium dolls. Uh, they're designer dolls, the ones that you can really choose all the bits and bobs on them. And then you can add a monogrammed heart. And all the dolls come with a little pocket on the back. We call it a purpose pocket, where there's a blank cloth. You can leave a meaningful message or a prayer or something sweet inside. And then we have smaller dolls that are about like this big. We call petite dumiers, which are really, really simple. Um, so you can't choose their hairstyle and all of that jazz. But uh, they're great for younger kids. And then we have doll making kits, which are really fun so they have it's like a little suitcase and it has everything inside you need to design a doll with three changes of clothing um, and actually next month we are doing a create for good campaign over um, uh, spring break so we're we're going out into the schools to motivate the schools to get involved to basically get as many kids to design a doll with their DIY doll kit as possible over spring break, knowing that for each one of you that participate, that we're able to gift another one to a child in need. So. What I suggest is everyone goes online and buys one tonight. <laughs> I'm sure there's a website. Yeah, you probably have a mom or a sister or a girlfriend or yourself. Yeah, you can, yes. whatever, whatever you want. I'm sure you can find somebody that, that would like one. They're really, they're really cool. They're really cool. You should check them out. Actually, one thing I want to mention about kind of the, the link maybe between the two um, is, is we're both in a sense social enterprises. So I don't know if you guys know the term and, and really understand what it means. And I think our two paths were very different to how we became or we are social enterprise and, and the concept of that. Um, I can speak for ourselves. You know, we're a business. We, we saw this opportunity to make an impact that we wanted to make an impact by applying what we think is, oops, um, you know, basic engineering 
power that mankind has, right? We're smart as humans. We, we aren't that stupid. Um, we're lazy, but not that stupid when we don't want to be. And, and we realized if you just apply that to buildings, there's a big impact. So that's what we wanted to do, bring engineering to buildings. Um, it wasn't until something called The Venture, which is a, social, a global social enterprise competition, that we started to realize the true social impact of what we were doing and the environmental impact. We always knew it was there, but it was through this, this contest that we had won in 2006 that we started to really explore and understand that. And, and we were preceded by um, Sohar and her team who won the first ever regional venture competition to represent the UAE on a global scale as one of the 20 best and most promising social enterprises in the world. So that's how we met actually, because we were the second year winner. Um, but the whole concept of social enterprises, the more you do as a business, the better you do, the better the planet and somebody else does. Um, and so it's this like vit virtuous cycle to where it doesn't hurt to make money because that money is gonna be invested and in do something better. So for us, it's invest more and save more energy and more buildings, which means reduce carbon output and solve climate change. Um, so it's, you know, for us, it's, it's a very strong part of who we are as a company because every day we know we're doing good for the world and the better we do, the, the more impact we have. So I just wanted to mention that before I forgot. <laughs> For Taka, when you first started your company, what were your clients' reactions to you wanting to like not have them pay for you to help save money? Yeah, that were crazy. <laughs> and it's too good to be true. So it's interesting. Like we walk in, we aren't used car sales, but it sounds like it sometimes. Like, hey, no money down. We're gonna do all this work and save you, and you get free money. Right? So it's kind of like, yeah, but there's a catch. What's the catch? It's too good to be true. And, and it really isn't. I mean, look, like the, back to the other question, like we make money. Like we aren't saying we don't make money. We're gonna make a lot of money because we're taking a big risk and we're adding a lot of value to the, to the customer, but you'd be amazed on how many people don't do it. I think we have right now 100 proposals out. That's 100 people that we've said we'll give you free money free technology, free equipment, save you energy, give you free money, take all the risk, and you're gonna help solve climate change. And you just have to sign, literally sign one piece of paper, and they don't do it. Um, so is it because it's too good to be true? Is it because they don't care enough? There's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of questions, but in, in general, they're very happy, they're very excited. They're like, you're telling me I don't have to pay and you can do this? And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, okay. So that's why we have 100, you know, we have probably 50 projects now, we have 100 proposals out and like 500 others that want us to do it. Um, so there's 30,000 buildings in Dubai, all of them that need this retrofit. There's 40,000 in Abu Dhabi, 100,000 in Saudi, and 50 million around the world. So, a lot of work. All right. Yeah, we have a question over on this side as well. Go ahead. Um, around how many buildings do you, like, how many people, like, buildings, like, do you use that technology in every year? Like, how many people? Um, so right now, we have, like I said, about 50 buildings that we're working on, like, in operation. So, um, you know, go, we go through this deep analysis phase to understand the building and how much can save and what we need to do. Then we do the installation. So we do the installation phase and once that's done, then we operate, monitor, maintain it for about five to 10 years. So we have about 50 that we've done some aspect and they're in kind of operations phase. Okay, I have a question for both of you. Was the whole beginning process of it really hard and did it take a lot of time to get started? Uh, it's hell, <laughs> it's hell. Um, I'll be completely honest. Um, it's, it's easier now today here in the UAE in Dubai. Five, six years ago when we started, there was nothing. There was no ecosystem for startups. You might have a different perspective. No VCs, no incubators. You can't even register a company. It costs a lot of money. Like, you need a local sponsor. You have to give half your company away. No customers want to use you. If you quit your job, you don't have a visa. You need to go home. Like. Just, that's just the infrastructural side, not the fact that you need to start a business that's gonna work. Um, so it, it, was, it was not easy, it's still not easy for us. I mean, yeah, you might look in the news and you might think we're like Fortune 500, 
no, we're not. We're still like a, a small struggling company that like fights every day and scraps to survive, you know? Um, so no matter how glitzy and glamour it looks on the outside, like it's, it's, always, it's always a challenge here. Um, in general, starting a company. But one thing that there's, it was a quote I saw it a couple years ago. I think it's five things like health, family, relationship, company. Maybe it's four. And you can only choose one. And then the other three, they go to zero. And so you have to ask yourself, am I ready? Oh, and money. Do you want money? Right? So you can, you can only choose two. So usually if you want the company to work, then the rest are going to go to zero. So it's easy to sit here and say, okay, yeah, sure, I won't see my friends as much, or I'll get a little fat, and it'll work out, whatever. Great. But when you're like two years into it, and you have no friends, and you feel like death every day, and you're broke, and your company's failing, and then it's like year three, and you're like, I'm even fatter, and I have less friends, and I haven't talked to my family, and my company, you know, like, are you ready and willing to do that? Like, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Like, is the idea worth it? Are you ready? Are you gonna work that hard? And are you gonna have the support structure around it? So I would suggest don't get that fat. Like, work out a bit more. That's my only, that's like the biggest thing. Like, if I would've exercised a bit more, I think I would've been way better off, because it like helps you mentally, and then you have energy and stuff. Sorry, I don't know if that was a point. <laughs> you really inspired them there. <laughs> They're all like, yes, let's start a business. But there's boss, definitely start a business. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what you, I mean, what he's saying, it is really, it, it is really hard. It's hard. Um, the infrastructure in the UAE is not the most conducive to startups. It's, um, it's a great place to do business when you're a big business, but when you're a small business, it's really tough because you basically pay the same fees as the big businesses do. Um, so that that is hard. But I think, other than that, um, I think mental agility is so important when you're doing something like this. Because literally, we all come to the table with strengths, right? Like maybe you're, okay, so for me, I'm a good designer, right? So I understand design or I understand branding, right? But then like you have to know about finance and you have to know about uh, lead generation, like new business development and you have to know about production and like how am I gonna make these dolls and where's the money gonna come? I mean like. A business has so many different facets, and when you start out, generally speaking, it's you, maybe one or two other people sitting at the table trying to figure it out. Um, which is part of what makes it exciting, though, to be honest with you, is you really learn a lot about different things. Um, you're forced to. Um, but it is tough, like, okay, for me, I had a son a year ago, and um, there's, no, there's no maternity leave when you're the boss. So like I had a baby on a Tuesday and then I was stayed in the hospital on Wednesday and Thursday. I went home Thursday and then I had the weekend, two days, and then on Sunday morning I was sitting at my desk because that's just the way that it is. You know, like when you're a small business and you're a startup, it doesn't work unless you're working. So, um, so yeah. But it's still, like, I'm still here and I'm still doing it, right? So, like, it can't be that bad. Um, you just take the baby with you everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. So, I hope that answered your question. Let me add one bit. Sorry, I don't, don't want to end on a negative note. You should definitely do it. It's just, that's the test you have to ask yourself. And if it, if it passes that test and you're ready and willing to do that, then definitely do it. You will learn so much more about yourself. The rate at which you will grow as a person and be able to contribute to your family, to society, and life will exponentially increase. Um, yeah, I'm still here too. We're still here, we're alive. Like, um, it, it's, it's, it can be rough, but it's also really, really great. Okay, I think we have enough time for maybe two more questions. Um, what's the technology behind like all of your energy savings? Like how do you achieve a 30% like savings from your bill? Just turn off the lights when no one's there. I'm, just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> So we don't, it's not a specific technology. We're, we're basically, we're all engineers, right? So we look at a building and see why is it consuming energy and how. And so the main driver for energy consumption in buildings, if anybody guesses it right, I'll give you five dirhams. What, oh gosh, shoot. Yeah. No, oh, but why the AC? What's, what's the reason the buildings consume energy? I said it earlier, no one was listening. No. 
No, people. Buildings consume energy to serve the people that are in it. If there's nobody in the building, energy is zero. All this energy, all this carbon in these buildings is because of us, humans. We're the cause of it, right? We want it to be really cold. We want nice lights. We want hot water. We want cold water. That's the whole reason. So, um, you know, the most high-performing building is an empty one because you can turn it off. No, back to the question. So sometimes it's simple. Like, yeah, literally turn off the lights and AC when no one's in the room, especially these types of rooms where there's high occupancy in an auditorium and then it's zero. So you have to have the systems in place to know when people are here or not. So in this case, we put an occupancy sensor, right? A light sensor to know other people in here. And if it's not, turn the AC off. Um, sometimes we replace entire chillers, all the fans, all the pumps, all the motors, all the pipes. Sometimes we put in new boilers. Like, so it's not like one specific technology. It's whatever the building needs to, to save energy. And then there's the technology layer above that where we take the technology to the cloud and then we can control from our command center, my phone, I can turn off, you know, the Fairmont Palm, like so we can control the AC and lights and stuff. Uh, and then there's the big data analytics and AI and the cloud level above that. So that's just more for us to know and predict what's going to happen. Okay, and one last question. Uh, okay, I have a question in regards to the um, Dell production line. Uh, what was your approach to uh, marketing your business? Like how long have you been marketing for? When did you start seeing results? So um, I think the most important piece for us from a marketing perspective is our story. And that is, is what sells Dumye. It's the intention behind the business. It's the story of me and my daughter. It's the, it's, it's the why and then the how we give back. That's what people, that's what moves people. Because to be honest with you, there's a ton of doll companies in the world. It's not that the world needs another doll, you know, but, but people buy Dumier emotionally, you know? They buy that doll because they feel like all of those emotions that I talk about, the reason why that doll exists, they feel that in the doll and they want to give that to their child, you know? Like they feel like that they're passing that energy on to their kid. And so from a marketing perspective, the story is big and we, uh, you know, we, before we launched, we were on social media talking about the dolls and what we were doing and kind of like leading up to it. I mean, I was a bit of an amateur. I, I understood packaging and how to position a brand, but not necessarily like social media marketing. So it was a bit of a crash course, but I, I started to talk about it. And then the day that we, um, the second day that we launched actually, um, Someone, I, the word had gotten back to Louise Nickel, who is the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar here. And she, I don't know how she discovered us, but she did. And so she bought a doll for her daughter. And then she posted a picture of that on Instagram. And then she was like, can we feature you in Harper's Bazaar? And I was like, yes, yes you can. I would love to do that. Um, and so it kind of spiraled from there. And the reason why it was interesting was because of the why. It was the brand. I mean, the dolls are pretty. I'm not saying they're not pretty. They are pretty. But like, there's a lot of pretty things that are out in the world. It is the context of it. So being able to have a strong story, to know why you're doing something, to be able to convey that to people you know, in an authentic way. And, and if you're genuinely trying to do something that is better for the world, people will rally you. Um, they will fight your corner. They will give you space in the newspaper um, as they did for Dumier. I mean, we've been, I, I'm sure you are the same, but like in Forbes magazine, like, I mean, just, this is crazy. Like that this, like doll ladies in Forbes, I, you know what I mean? But because of, because of the story, because of, of why we do things, um, people champion us. So, I don't know if that answered your question, did it? Yeah. And I think for you guys, for you guys especially uh, in the audience here, there are a lot of little good nuggets of authentic wisdom that, uh, that have just been shared, and I hope that you guys take a lot of these stories personal little anecdotal evidence and pieces of information so that when you guys are moving forward in your social entrepreneurship unit and ideas and thoughts and 
kind of development, uh, a lot of this stuff might come in handy. So I wanted, I guess, on behalf of the school to say thank you to our guests. You, you came last year and you were gracious enough to do the same this year. Uh, we do have a little bit of a parting gift that you're, uh, that you're special, what do we call you guys? Like uh, su support people over here, Danya and, uh, and Kareem are, will share with you. So thank you very much. One more round of applause to everybody. We really appreciate your time. And the rest of you guys may head off to lunch. Thank you very much for your time as well.